What does a CMO actually do? As a chief marketing officer. Chief right? marketing officer. So what, what's, the, what's the role of a CMO? So it, that's a great question because so many people are CMOs and right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so a CMO is actually the head leadership of the strategic rollout of the actual brand. So internally and externally, the CMO works with communications, for instance, to understand what is our mission and purpose of the company and how are we executing that mission and purpose internally and externally. So how are we educating and uh, informing our employees, our investors, our stakeholders? Are all of those communications in line with what we say we stand for and what we say we believe in? And then to that end, we are responsible for generating X amount of revenue with consumer base. So how are we messaging to our target consumer in a way that speaks to our mission and our purpose and keeping all of, keeping track of all of that constantly and making sure that's a well-oiled machine for as little money as possible. Uh, that was going to be my next thing. It was, there's a budget that you're given. And so <laughs> I mean, talk about that part. Like you're doing the most with sometimes less. The least. Yes. Yeah, you're making magic happen. So well, there's there's three types of impressions. There are owned impressions, which is earn your leisure. You guys own your impressions, right? Uh, there are earned impressions, which is publicity, PR, or as Puff would always say, guilt by association. And then there's paid impressions, and that's where you're spending money for media dollars, right? So there's three ways of generating So what's that again? Visibility. What's the first one? It's owned. What's that? Owned impressions are your own impressions. So however many followers you have on social media, however many followers you have on YouTube coming to earn your leisure to view, you know, view your content, those are your impressions. You own them. Organic reach. Organic reach. And then what's the second one? Earned. What's the, what's the earned? Earned media impressions are press. Are like somebody writes an article. Somebody writes an article. You go on a podcast. Go on, you go on someone else's podcast. So I repost your content mm -hmm. or I invite you to participate in an event or part of co-branded partnership and then you generate impressions based on that so you go on good morning america tomorrow those are all earned media impressions and then what's the third one and the third ones are paid and that's all advertising so that's sponsorship that's media Billboard, advertising billboards commercials that's yes above the line advertising so print out of home radio and digital are the four out of home excuse me above the line paid media and then there's below the line paid media so you could pay influencers you could pay for pot product placement you could pay for branded entertainment strategy it's all sorts of below the line things you could do to pay for awareness and connectivity and you've seen that shift right because as from when you started print was a thing yes not so much a thing anymore right more money needs to go into digital how have you navigated that? You know, it's been it's been great because one of the things that we did early on at Blue Flame and why we were so successful, but it was an uphill battle back then, is we were a below the line agency. So we hyper focused on influencer connectivity. We hyper focused on social media and digital media, which at the time people were buying Super Bowl commercials and then that was it. We're going to spend $2 million on a Super Bowl commercial. Yeah, we did it. Whereas us, we wanted to actually take over Twitter and have, you know, the best handles for our brands and connect at a very organic level. And people just weren't using those strategies back then. So we had tremendous success in disrupting, disrupting in, um, in the category and in culture. And being an expert at that, obviously, 15 years later is, is really interesting to see. So... Okay, let's talk about these different types of strategies. Mm -hmm. So, because I have like a unofficial doctorate degree in marketing. I know, that's right. So, <laughs> I have theories on this, but mm -hmm. I think that the organic way is probably like 10 times more effective than paid marketing, right? Absolutely. Um, it's more expensive. I mean, it's less expensive. It's, so it's less expensive it. and it's more effective. Ex as yes. far as, for, I was always taught like, you have to run like, I don't know exact numbers, but let's say like five paid ads to convert one person where an organic, it might just be two, two yes. times somebody actually sees you and then they'll just start to follow you. Although it's like, 
And that's what we've done. We've never paid for any marketing. It's all been through word of mouth. Yes. Um, it moves a lot faster and it's, it's a lot more trustworthy than just seeing constant ads. So if you were advising a client, how would you advocate for them to grow their business effectively in today's world with dividing those three different things that you just said? Like, yeah. what's the strategy for a small business or just any size business that's looking to, you know, grow their marketing campaign? You know, so that's a really good question. And it's hard to kind of sum it up in a nutshell, because I think it does depend on nuance, because you're right. It, it is better, meaning the stickiness around your connection with your, your consumer is better organically. But if your goal is to create awareness, right, because there's awareness and then there's affinity. So awareness is people being familiar with your brand. If I say earn your leisure in Bangladesh, do they know where earn your leisure is, right? That's awareness, right? Like they know who Puff Daddy is in mm -hmm. Bangladesh, right? But affinity means they watch the Earn Your Leisure podcast. They come to the, you know, to the the conferences. They they know you by name and so they have that connectivity. So sometimes organic works best because you're trying to ultimately get to affinity. But if you are trying to quickly build awareness around your brand, paid media can be effective. Case in point, people um, that have e-commerce uh, companies nowadays buy social media ads for conversion, right? They want to sell their product. They run IG ads. The more ads they run, the more eyeballs they see, the more people convert. And they can do that very quickly because they have a transactional commodity. They're selling makeup, right, or water. Whereas you guys are building an intellectual property. So it's more important for you to build organic connection because people need to think to understand why you're valuable. They don't need to do, they need to think. So it's a different, there's a different modality there. So it really does depend on what your brand is trying to achieve. But to the quick answer is you spend the biggest amount of your time on earned media. Earned media. Because people trust um, recommendation. So there's a trusted brand in Earn Your Leisure. And... If Ian says, go buy Apple, which is what he always seems to say. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I watch your podcast, shout, right? Shout out to Market Mondays. <laughs> Market Mondays. Ian says, go buy Apple. People are going to trust you guys and potentially at least go research Apple, right? So there's a earned, that's an earned media impression for Apple. Every single time Ian says that. You see the value? So if you go to earned first, you're going to not only get the association with whatever brand value that thing has, you're going to be introduced to expanded audiences. It's going to create all of these other tentacles for your brand that will automatically get you owned media impressions. Those are going to come because you convert people that way. And then you continue to connect with your owned media community. And once you start building up money, you make investment in paid and it becomes this nice ecosystem that works for your brand. So in marketing, they say cults become culture, mm -hmm. meaning it's more efficient to just focus on a small group of people and have them be evangelist for you as opposed to just trying to spread yourself too thin because eventually those small group of people will grow. Osmosis. And will become culture, right? Yes. It's like the 12 disciples, right? Like eventually <laughs> this becomes 2 billion Christians around the world. What's your thoughts on that? Because that's something that a lot of people don't really do effectively either. Like they come out the gate and just try to just be all things to every, all people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. As opposed to really honing in and building a very small, tight knit community and then kind of just growing it like that. One million percent. I am always about vertical versus horizontal strategy. So it's like zero in on who your core audience is and hyper, hyper penetrate that audience. So get them in every place that they are passionate. So if your audience works nine to five, you probably should be targeting them from six to 10. You know what I mean? But if your audience is, if your audience are creatives, you have to figure out where those key touch points are for them and hyper-focus on those areas because you wanna get them when their mindset is in the thing that they are passionate about. So it's not necessarily 
just getting them. It's connecting with them in emotional moments that make sense for them so that they remember you. When you talked about uh, paid media and you said you go under the line, and I'm wondering now, if you're doing that vertical method, how do you select the influencers, the the media? Because a lot of times we'll hear black media, right? But when we think of that, we'll stick and we'll stay in that familiarity, but we won't get that notoriety from other brands. So how how did you or how do you navigate through that? It's again, it's nuanced because you have to prioritize what's most important to you first, right? Like, so if if you, the segment of the population is, I want 18 to 34 year olds first, right? There's a certain age group that you want to target. And then you might say, well, out of the 18 to 34, I think that our brand skews more male, right? Which is a little unique now with, with gender fluidity, but you know, there's, do you, do you target male conversations versus women conversations, all of those things? And then once you figure that out, you start to say, is there a factor around race? Is there a factor around geo-targeting? Like, do I target Brooklyn? Like you said, Brooklyn's your number one audience versus WeHo, Los Angeles, right? So you start to zero in on where your bullseye is and you spend your the most of your time in that space, but you also look at the whole of that that segment as well. Does that make sense? So you're not trying to get 25 to 54 year olds. You're trying to get as many 18 to 34 year olds as possible. And then within that, you're carving out sub segments to figure out how to connect with them. And you do that based on a number of things. 